Okay, so, um, well, I hope all of you all got, got your, who were able to access your marks, and I'll bring back the scripts on um, Wednesday morning, so you'll have that, and we'll go through it um, next to the session, maybe in a couple of weeks or so. All right? Okay, so we started talking about designing uh, filters last week, and, and uh, specifically, we spoke about designing um, a type of filter called an FIR filter. FIR standing for finite impulse response. We saw that that, and we we, we went through this sometime before too. That discrete si systems or digital systems can have two types of reactions when you send an impulse into it. One, it can keep generating values coming out as a result of the impulse, and we call that a, a finite impulse response. To, sorry, an infinite impulse response system, or you put an impulse into it and it will generate a fixed number of values coming out and then it stops. The values go back down to zero. And we call those finite impulse response um, systems. In our case, we saw that when you block, when, when you um, uh, model the, the transfer functions, that the infinite impulse response systems have both feed forward and feedback parts in the transfer function. In other words, the transfer functions has poles and have poles and zeros. The finite response transfer functions only have feed forward components. In other words, they only have zeros on them, okay? And then we started to talk with the first type of FIR filter we looked at was the moving average filter. And the moving average filter does exactly that. It takes an average of a certain number of points um, but that average keeps moving around. So it's, it's almost like, if you like a, like, like a sliding window in a way, a, a window of fixed length um, um, n, and it averages the value of the, the, the data points within n, um, and, and you go along. So the, the, the um, sort of approach that that takes is that if in that group of data points, there's one data point that is um, anomalous. You have a nice set of data, whatever the value happens to be, but somewhere inside of there, there are one or maybe two points that are anomalous. By averaging out over a, um, a, a series of points before and after the anomalous points, you kind of flatten out everything. We saw that that basically means removing high frequency information. Sudden changes in data are high frequency changes. So that the, the moving average filter is really a, a form of a low pass filter. It's very easy to design. Um, and all you basically have to know is, is well, what is your um, sampling frequency and what is your cutoff frequency for the, um, the, the, the filter, specifically the zero crossing uh, frequency. If you remember, the, the response looks something like this, right? So you need to know this point here, all right? And then, of course, you always need to know FS. And uh, once you know FS and FC, that gives you the, the number of terms you need to average to get that sort of behavior. The response is not ideal because we saw that the real ideal low pass filter behavior is really something that would look like this, right? And, and flat all from here. This is not going, doing that at all. And in fact, is lopping off a lot of stuff that should have been in that blue zone there. So it's not quite there, but it's very easy to design and, and it is used a lot to get rid of, of sort of high frequency noise in data. Once you have that then, then you kind of work and, and, and do some more specific filtering later on. So after that though, we said, okay, well, let's see how we could design a somewhat better um, finite response filter. And then we started to look we, we, we led into it by looking at something, a transfer function of the form that you're seeing on the screen there. That particular transfer function is what you call a symmetric sequence or a symmetric, tra symmetric transfer function because it's symmetrical about some middle point here. The coefficients on either side of it, one away, are the same, two away are the same, and if you had three, there would have been one and one, and so you keep going on. So it's symmetrical about some um, central point. And if you get the 
um, frequency response of it. The frequency response, again, is also symmetrical. And as somebody pointed out in class, when you do this, the imaginary components of one side and the other cancel. So what you get is a transfer function that only has real parts in it. If it only has real parts, it doesn't have any phase information in it. So this particular one is a constant phase relationship. So if I were to plot the phase against frequency in, in, in this, this one, because it's constant, right? You will get a phase looking like that. In other words, it's the, the, each frequency component gets delayed by the same amount, basically. The, the, the thing about this is that the problem with this sequence is that it's anti-causal. Remember, Z minus two is a delay. Z plus two in as a, is an advance. So, so this needs something to happen before time equal to zero. To make it causal, what we can do is to delay everybody by the same amount. So you delay everybody by, by two samples, basically. And you get a transfer function looking like this one below here. And remember, just as an up point, delaying, delaying the response of a transfer function for us is just if you think about it, is it's um like in your in, in, in your computer systems or your discrete systems and so on, you have a clock. So what this will basically mean is that for two clock cycles here, you have the answer and they do nothing. So you hold back the answer for two clock cycles and then you generate the result. That is delaying it. So the input came in, you calculated the output and then you held the output for two, size, for, for two additional cycles without doing anything. And then you spit out the, um, the, 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 the response. That is as simple as, uh, as how a delay would work in a, real, in, in a real application. When you did this, this, as you saw, when you take the, 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 the um, transfer function of it, because of the properties of the Z transform, this just re results in a, a constant e to the j, e to the minus j, two pi, um, sorry, two capital omega. That is a constant phase angle, right? A tan minus one um, uh, of two omega, and because you remember omega is two pi f over fs. So having f, having fixed your value of fs for any particular ang um, value, that is just a constant. All right. So in that case, you get this one is also going to give you a constant phase, uh, a phase delay, and it's not going to um to, to, to affect the, the the linear behavior of it. You still have linear phase, and you have the response. And we saw um where we ended last time. Here's a here's a transfer function. Forget how I landed up with this. Somehow I landed up with uh, a transfer function looking like this. It is not causal, so to make it causal, what I want is that the, the last, the highest positive term, this must go to z to the power zero. So in other words, I have to delay everybody, I have to multiply this entire thing, left side and right side, by z to the power minus two. If I do that, then, of course, we're symmetrical about, about the, the 0.48. If I multiply both sides by z to the minus 2, then I get the causal version of it. Notice it's running from z to the power minus 4 to z to the power 0. And it is still symmetrical about here in that the coefficients are around this point here. You have a middle point here. But the coefficients are still symmetrical about that point. Yeah? Anybody not following, just let me know. You have to say something. Okay? And then if you plot that, and we saw that um, I showed you um, briefly last time. It wasn't showing particularly well, but there's a MATLAB tool called Filter Designer. And if you um, import, and, and if you have some time today, I'll, I'll bring it back up and, and, and you'll see again. So if you import the numerator and, co and denominator coefficients of a z into it and tell it to plot the response, notice the magnitude response is, well, whatever it is, we don't know what this was supposed to be. But look at the phase response. 
right? This is a this is linear. This is a linear phase response. Okay, in other words, for a particular frequency, you get a delay of something. For another put another frequency, if you look at the, the, the ratio of the delay to the frequency, the value is the same. Okay, because the slope of this is, 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 is constant. It is a negative slope because it is a delay. All right, so a constant phase delay until, of course, they, 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 they cut off frequency and then the, the moving average, well, this particular filter, sorry, has, a, has another passband in it here. And once it has a passband, of course, that passband also has a continuous, um, sorry, a linear phase relationship. Yeah? Everybody following that? Are you okay with that? Yes, sir. All right? Good. So let's go back to a little bit of, um, of, of where we are at and, and how to design this thing now. So the digital filter types, if you have no feedback parts or it is non-recursive, which is a more technical term, term for it, you get a finite impulse response, right? And of course, the, the, the block diagram for the transfer function will look, will look like this. Remember the block diagrams are a set of B, um, X, Ns, if you like, or, or BZs, perhaps BZs might be the BZ to the minus um, Ns, a whole series of that, over a sum of A, Z to the minus Ns, whatever that is. That is standard nomenclature. So the, the numerator coefficients are Bs and the denominator coefficients are As. That we've adopted a standard um, a standard approach, which is what every textbook and, and, and even MATLAB and they use. They use B for the numerator, A for the denominator. Why ever, I'm, I'm not too sure. Okay, so how do we design a filter to do what we want? We saw in the case of the moving average filter, all you needed to know is where the, the zero crossing point was, the, the zero point, and the sampling frequency, and you have a filter to go. So let's see if we could do something a little bit um, um, similar to, to, to this one. This is a more formal type of design. It's supposed to be a better response filter that we're dealing with. So the first thing is that we need to start with an ideal response. The ideal filter response, and then what we need to do is to find, remember it's a finite response filter. So we need to find the finite sequence that best represents what that impulse response is and it must be symmetric. Okay, so these three things. One, you get an ideal response. Two, you truncate that response to finite. And three, you make sure that what you have now is somehow you make it um, symmetric, all right? Symmetric is what is going to guarantee the phase behavior that we want. Most common analog filters, um, and, and I'm using this in the, the, the sort of generic term, analog meaning even the analog filters that we use to design, to design um, digital filters. Right? So even the most, and, and, and this is the, um, one of the, the, the things that we also do in the discrete world, because a lot of things have been designed and, and work well in the analog world, we start with what is working well and we know it, it works well. And then we try to adapt it or as we say, uh, as we've saw, seen before, you sample it to try and see what it, what it works like in the discrete domain and then we, we tweak it as, as we need to be. The problem is, is that most analog filter designs have an infinite impulse response because they have poles and zeros. Right, so this is giving it the in, infinite response type. So, for instance, a Butterworth filter, and we'll see this in our, um, um, maybe start seeing it on Wednesday and, and, and into next week. They, they, like a Butterworth filter that you would use to make a discrete time Butterworth filter, which is what you see in the response here. This impulse response goes on, right? These values that are looking just because of the scale. If you look at these values here, the values actually are 0.00 something something. And it goes on for quite a while 
before you get enough zeros to say that it's it's essentially zero, um, um, actually zero. Okay. Remember again, you you are using um or these sort of things implemented in 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 in, in computer systems. If it's an eight bit or a sixteen bit or a thirty two bit or sixty four bit, um, that will determine how many zeros you could keep going on and on until you actually have a definite one that they could say is zero, right? And it could be quite a large number. And each one of these has to be stored somewhere. Hence the, 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 the term that we use, which is infinite response. So uh, what we do is to, to take this, the thing that we know is working, but we stop it after a certain number. So we make the, the, the response stop after N, some N that we choose. That creates the finite response filter. But of course, if you remember from, from one of our very early lectures, that once you truncate the response, then the, the behavior is going to be different between what it originally was doing and what you're actually getting it um, doing right now. Right? So again, like, like um, a lot of things that we've spoken about before, like sampling and like the FFT and, and, and the like, digital filter design too is also an approximation. But if you're careful and you, you are cautious about what you do, the approximation works very, very well for us. So the impulse response, as we said, if it is a finite response, then the impulse response will look something like what we have on top there. HN is just going to be a series of values. There's no feedback in it. The transfer function is therefore going to be of the form HZ looking like that. It has all zeros and is absolutely stable. And here I should have um, actually um, used maybe B instead. Right, just to be consistent, right? So when you when 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 you do this, this really would be B M. So when you get it, you you get the transfer function that has the Bs alone, right? When you do this, it um this is going to be B naught plus well, if I use common B B naught plus B one Z minus one plus B two Z minus two over one because it has no zero, it has no poles on it. Okay, everybody clear with that? Yes. I know I'm in writing it down. I like like how I have it here, but technically, really to be editorially correct, it should have been um B there instead of A. All right. Right. So there are two ways now that we approach the the the, the FIR filter design. One is something by call, called time sampling. So you take a response that is doing something in time and we sample that and we get what we want. Or there's another one where we look at what the thing is doing in frequency and we sample that. So let's start looking at the time sampling one. We'll comment on the frequency sampling one um, a little later on. So what it does, you want to design a filter. Remember we, we are designing an FIR filter to meet some sort of frequency response. So what you do? Okay, we start with an ideal response. So let's start with a low pass filter. An ideal response for a low pass filter. If you remember, the ideal response for a low pass filter looks like that diagram here. We are custom only drawing, we normally only draw this bit here, right? Because we don't deal with the negative frequencies at all. But you remember, because of the, 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 the either the DTFT or the, um, the, the, the CTFT, either of them, they generate both positive and negative frequencies. It is because of the, the, the complex response and you actually, for, for, for a complete behavior, you need to, 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 to account for the negative frequencies as well as the positive frequencies as well. So a low pass filter ideally this is what the ideal response looks like. It has a pass band and the amplitude is one all the way through. We are right with that? And the use of the negative frequencies, right? Yeah. Hmm. 
right? And this is either the DTFT or CTFT, right? Because they are complex coefficients. So it must have a negative, must have negative and, and, and positive frequency values in there. Right. So you start with that. So if I give you this, if HF is shown here, then what is this sequence that will give me a response looking like that? If I give you a rectangular pulse in frequency, what is the behavior in time that gives me this? This is frequency. So time looks like, time looks like what? The same function. Right, that thing that we're talking about for years now. If you have a rectangular pulse in frequency, then the time response going to give you a sync function. And of course, vice versa. If we had a pulse in, 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 in time, then the, the, the frequency response would be um, a sync function. Right, so this is frequency. The, 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 the function, and we saw this as a your, your normal inverse transform kind of thing. HN is going to give me a sync function. I'll leave you to, 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 to show me if we have it in other slides. It appears in this form. Right? So HN is a sine x over x function. So you could, you could if you do the if you do the, the inverse for it, you get it in this form, or you could get it in sync function form. This here, for the purposes of working it out by hand, if you uh, take this and you cancel the t's here and substitute for omega c, you get this version here down here. I want you to commit this to memory, okay? Learn this like vocabulary. All right, so whatever it is, if you have, notice carefully, if you have, a frequency response HF that is running from minus capital FC to FC. In other words, that's a cutoff frequency, right? I should have put an F here, right? So this is um, capital F here, right? The um, time sequence response that gives you that behavior, which is a sync function, this is the version of it that I want you to remember. Right, so you know everything here already. You'll know this because you always need to start off with something like that, and you will know this because this is the cutoff frequency that you're dealing with. This is this bit here. All right, so commit this to memory. Whatever you do, commit this to memory. If you remember it in this form up here, right, and the T's cancel, you could do it the same the, the, the same way too. And this this is two pi f over. Fs or two, um, so the T's cancel on top here too, so you could get you, you, you could work it out accordingly. Okay, but remember the bottom one. The time response is infinite, so we need to once I get Hn, Hn is going to go on. Remember this thing goes. This is this is the magnitude of the response here. It goes on 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 on. Right, remember this is the magnitude of HN here, right? The actual sync function, you know, does this, right? So we need to truncate it symmetrically. So I need to truncate it. This is a response. So I need to truncate this. This is the middle value here. I need to truncate this symmetrically. All right, so whatever number of samples I pick for n, right, this is n, this is minus n here. I have to truncate it symmetrically about the middle. All right, symmetrically will give me the linear phase relationship. If it's not symmetrical, I'm not going to get them. So you truncate it. So that means 
usually that they ordered that n is going to be odd. Because if I take the behavior here and I truncate it, this is zero here, and I truncate it symmetrically between minus n and plus n, you have minus n, you have this zero, and you have plus n. So if it to be minus n and plus n has to be equal. So if n minus n is, let's say minus three and plus n is three, this is going from minus three to plus three, which is seven values, including zero, right? So n is odd. By taking n odd, right? So if you take n as nine, then this is going to go from minus four to plus four. If you take n as 11, it's going to go from minus five to plus five and so on. All right? You guarantee that it's, it, it's symmetrical. And we go back to, to some stuff that we did before. When you truncate something, you're multiplying it by a rectangular window, right? In other words, you're taking this thing and you're multiplying it by a rectangular window of length n. So in other words, Hn is the infinite response. We multiply it by a rectangular window of length n, where n is odd, remember that, so that this is the truncated sequence, and this now is what the frequency response is going to look like. Yeah? Following? Make sense? All right? Or if you like, H W omega equal to H omega convolved with W omega. All right? So either they continue as a discrete time version. It doesn't it, it doesn't matter. They, they, they result are the same. We've done this before. So the effect of truncation, of course. The one on the left is the infinite response. The one on the right is where we impose a finite response on it symmetrically about the zero point. Remember now, we have imposed a period of n samples so that the frequency response now is going to be different. This is what, because we've imposed a, 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 now a truncated response of n, this is what the frequency response will be based on. And we remember we did that um, early on. So you're going to get some leakage and some 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 behavior and, um, that, that is a little bit um, not ideal. We started off with the ideal, but we are bringing it down to something realistic, but the realistic has some behaviors that we're going to have to compensate for, right? How do you reduce the effect of leakage? Remember that we use a sampling window. So instead of truncating the response by simply chopping it minus n to plus n, right? We want something where the transitions taper to zero. So we're going to use a humming window in this case, right? We could use any of the windows that we want except the rectangular window. Here's a little question. I'll leave you to answer that for me by Wednesday. This form of the, the humming window is a little bit different, very slightly different than the one from lecture nine, right? You'll tell me on Wednesday why. Okay, let's go forward. So let's see how we're going to um, the mechanics of 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 um, designing a filter now. So we know everything that we need. We need now. We say, okay, I need now a cutoff frequency of five kilohertz, and you always have to have this somewhere inside of here. You must have a sampling frequency, and then we need, we're going to use a, a um, we're truncating the ideal response to an, to, to an even sequence, sorry, to a symmetrical sequence, and we're using nine samples. Okay, so if we're using nine, it means that we're running from minus four to plus four. So write down the information. FC is five kilohertz, Fs is 20 kilohertz. And again, remember from your, um, just as an aside, if you're given Fc, Fs should be at least twice this, okay? Just to satisfy the Nyquist criterion. 
And usually we don't go as, as close to that. We, we, we give ourselves a margin. So in this case, whoever is designing this decided to go in about four times as much. So we have the cutoff frequency five kilohertz, the sampling frequency at 20. So the first thing we need to do is to generate, remember, this is coming from, this is the response here. So this is going five kilohertz minus five kilohertz. So this is the ideal response. We are going to see the ideal sequence. So this is in frequency here. So we need to generate this sequence in time that gives me this ideal response in, 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 in frequency. To generate that now, remember the response is a sync function. And I told you, remember that version of the sync function here. Right? And this now n is going to go, just let me erase this little bit here. Right? We said that n is 9, so therefore n here is going to go from minus 4 to 4. So you know, your first step now, so this is now truncating the infinite response to a response that has nine samples in it. Okay? In other words, the impulse response of this is finite nine samples long. Yeah? Make sense? Everybody following so far? Yes, sir. Right. If you happen to do this in MATLAB, MATLAB, if you tell MATLAB sync of some value, it calculates sync pi t over pi t. So if I wanted to calculate sync, if I do the substitution inside of here, fc over fs is 5 over 20, and 2 of that will give you 0.5. And again, inside of here, you get 0.5 pi n. So to calculate, the sync function using MATLAB, you just give it a function sync 0.5n. Well, 0.5 sync 0.5n. If you're doing this with a calculator, a warning here, remember to keep your calculator set in radians. All right. Remember to keep your calculator in radians when you're calculating that. A lot of times um, students, especially in the exam, they kind of forget and you run through and you're going to get, well, I'll show you the kind of values you're going to get. Right, so we set that up and we generate the values. The next thing, of course, keep that there. We're going to do everything together. The next thing now is this, the, 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 the humming window. Again, we have the humming window and we're going to generate nine samples here. N is nine. Right, so this is 0.46 cosine 2 pi and n here going, well, from minus four to four, and this is over eight. This too, you keep your calculator in radians. So if you take the, 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 this, this here, which I tell you to commit to memory. All right, just let me get back the pen. This one here, and generate HN, and then use it to generate WN. So HN is this, based on the equation on the previous page. WN is this, and I'm going to give you all these. Eh? So you'd have to you'd have to remember the the um, the Hamming window formula, Hamming window, triangle window, anything else that I want you to work with, you will get. Um, at the end of the, the paper, if I ask you to, to, to use that. So you don't need to memorize this, right? But you need to remember to keep your calculator in, um, in, in, in radians. So remember H, W, N is equal to this multiply by this. So you do a point to point multiplying now. So zero by 0 0.8 minus 0 0.1061 
by 0.21473, et cetera, et cetera. All right? Look at something very carefully here. Anybody notice something about the, 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 the values? Anything you notice? The uh, the well, the sequences are symmetric. Right, right. Because we be, because we truncated everything symmetrically about zero, both the values that you generate for H N and W N going to be symmetric. So here's a little thing that I'm going to tell you right now. When you're generating these things, look here and look here. The bottom values here. So once you've generated after the halfway stage, so this is minus four to zero. At one, this value, these two are supposed to be equal. At two, at three, and at four. Okay. So if you if you have done the calculations or you're in the process of doing your calculations and somewhere along the way, you realize that this set of values or this set of values looking different from the one above, okay? Then do what I've told, what, what I told you to do with the FFT. Make the bottom step here equal to the top. So apart from here, make the bottom set of values here symmetrical about the middle point here. All right. Once you do that, you're going to show me that you understand first off that they, 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 it was supposed to be symmetrical. You made a mistake somewhere where you, you understand that it's supposed to be symmetrical. And better yet, you're going to get a symmetrical transfer function. If you make um if you make a mess and the the the, the values here are different from the values here, then the transfer function is not going to be symmetric, so the filter will not be a FIR filter linear phase. Okay? So make sure and, and, and do that. You're doing a calculation. Caution one, make sure they calculate in radians. Caution two, when, whenever you generate the values, make sure that the values, after you have done the, 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 the calculator um, um, derivations on it, make sure that they're symmetrical. Okay, if you don't have time to double check the values, then you take the top half and make it equal to the bottom half. All right, that way you'll guarantee at least I understand that you know what you're doing and you will be get, getting a, a symmetrical transfer function. Right, so if you multiply them now, this is what HW, HWN is going to look like. It's symmetrical about the middle. So now once we have that now, we go from here and the next step of course is to get HZ. So HZ, we write it down. These are just the, 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 um, the coefficients here. This for minus four, n equal minus four, three, two, one, zero, one, two, three, four. So if I write it out, right? The two n terms here are zero. So you could neglect, you could neglect this one and this one happily for us. So this particular filter, the non-causal transfer function is going to look like the one that you have right there. Notice it's symmetrical about 0.5. To make it causal, we look at the highest order positive that we have here. To make this zero, we have to delay this entire thing by z minus three. So you have to multiply both sides or delay both sides by three sample terms. You do that, you get the causal transfer function. It is still symmetrical, but everybody has been delayed by three samples. In other words, when the filter starts to work, it's going to take three clock cycles before it starts to generate the results coming out for you. All right, that's all. Look at the results here. The, the red line is, if I were to just 
take the 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 um the transfer the the HN and just use a rectangular window. The blue line is a Hamming window function. Notice both of them cut off at five kilohertz. That's the half power point here. This is zero point five. So FC. 0 0.5 or the 3 dB point is at 5 kilohertz, which is what we said. Notice that the, 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 the transfer function with the window is nice. There's a gentle order here. And notice after cutoff, um, it, there, there are no ripples in it. With a rectangular window, notice what is happening, that after cutoff, right, you're going to have a little pass band here and then another little pass band here. Okay, so it starts, it stops, it starts, it stops. And then, of course, you have a little amplitude. Remember the, 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 the real response that we're looking like, looking for, there's a color I wouldn't show here, is this. This is what we wanted. All right, none of them um, is, is, is there, but the the response of the window base one is substantially smoother than the one for the rectangular window. This one goes up and down. At least this one is attenuating you almost at a constant rate until they pass, and then there's no ripple in the pass band. Okay. Look at their phase. This is a big, big deal, though. Look at their phase response, which is the green line here. The phase response. For the filter, is linear. Right, I have the angles in degrees, so particular the slope here. So at two kilohertz, the delay is some deg some some um oops. At two kilohertz, the delay here is a value at uh, five kilohertz, the relative delay is some other value. So if you divide the, 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 um, the delay by the frequency, you get a constant line. So what this means is that as you pass through um, signals through this, all the frequencies get delayed relatively by the same amount. So when it's reassembled at the end, then the relationship between all of the signals remain the same so that you don't have the, the distortion. In other words, this is going to give you what we started off with, something called the distortionless transmission. Yeah? Make sense? All right. So that's one approach. The other approach now, which is not really part, is not going to be part of our course, but it really is um, a very good approach for unusual filter designs. For instance, right, and if you think about it, if I were to take a response that I know, right, so some arbitrary response, well, it's supposed to be symmetrical, my, my, my bad. Let me just erase that here. Right. If I were to take some response that is um, all right, so that is a response. It's symmetrical, all right, because it's a FIR response that we're looking like. So I take, um, or better yet, even better. I have some arbitrary uh, but put my in my pen. I have some response. This is what I have real time. So what I do, I implement this by this is what I know, zero to F C, right? Some behavior here. So I reflect this in negative frequencies because I must have both of them. 
And now I take the inverse Fourier transform of that, that response here. I take the inverse DTFT or inverse FFT, right? If I take a, a number of samples, so if I truncate it to, an, to a power of um, two to the power n, where, or, or sorry, n, where n is a power of two, then I could use an inverse Fourier transform, fast Fourier transform for it. So this now is going to give me a two-sided sequence. And then I just take the, the, the Z transform of that and delay it appropriately. This is great. And they use this for things like hearing aids. The hearing aid, what happens is that when you do a hearing test, you're going to find that, that the, the frequency the, uh, response of the, uh, of, of the persons is not going to be a, a, a low pass or a high pass. It's going to be some very strange frequency response. So you sample that frequency response, all right? That is part of the thing. You have to sample the frequency response. So you take a, 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 an appropriate number of samples in frequency. Then you make, the, you, you make that number of samples symmetric and then you find the inverse transform either the dft or fft of that and because you have taken you're running it with, with, with um from minus ft to fc you're going to get the two-sided sequence and then you take this air transform delay and then you implement and that's how they actually um create the, the, the in sort of hearing aids, the filter response to, to, to correct the, 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 the frequency response of the person's ear and so on. It's a very nice approach um, to it. They, 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 they also use it, for instance, in controls, in con discrete control systems. If you know what the transfer function response is going to be, and that is not a filter, but it, it, it's supposed to have some sort of transfer um, function response, you sample that response in frequency and then take the inverse transform. You get back the time sequence and then you can make it closer. Yeah, it's not part of our, um, it's not something that we're going to do um, any further here, but it is a very nice um, application of, of, of using the, 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 the inverse Fourier transform um, or the inverse um, discrete Fourier transform to, to get a usable uh, time sequence that you can apply. Yeah. Right, so questions, everybody all right? Or following, at least followed what we did this morning? Yeah? Yes, yeah, sir. All right, so we they, 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 I'll put it up already. There's an example lecture following, this is a 16, number 17 is an example slide. Um, with two two examples, uh, and uh, um, what do you call it, uh, moving average, and one of these window based um, designs on it. So have a look at it, read it through. We'll run through that on 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 Wednesday morning, and then we'll start looking now at the other type of filters, which are the in, infinite impulse response. One of the things about finite response filters, if you look here, right, this one. Notice that the highest order here. So this is in fact a sixth order filter because the highest number, the, the largest delay that you have here is six, right? A sixth order filter, notice that the response is still relatively shallow. If you want to get something that is close to that sort of sharp cutoff behavior that the, the ideal filter response looks like, and you have to crank up N to a significant amount, typically, 15, 20, 30, and so on. That's not too much of an issue, right? Especially because the main reason you're using this type of filter is because you want the linear phase behavior, right? This is what you're after. So the order of the filter um, is not so much of an issue as the fact that you are ha absolutely have to have distortionless transmission. What we will see is that for the same, the same order filter, you can get a much sharper cutoff or a much sharper response with the infinite we um infinite impulse response filter than the finite. So for instance, n equal, we just had n equal to six. 
the IIR will probably give you that where they in, the, the FIR is giving you this sort of behavior. Of course, it is doing, it will do that at the expense of the, of the linear phase behavior. Okay, so everything as usual is a trade-off. And we're going to talk more about that come Wednesday, please God. All right, and I'll also bring back um, your, your, what do you call it? Your midterm um, papers for you. So you'll have that and, we, uh, and you could, could see where um, where you fell down and, and, and where not, right? Most people did generally good. As I mentioned, um, there were some um, who's, who uh, didn't do as well as, as they should have and they know why. All right, so so I don't need to um, really um, um, go through in too much detail about that. All right, so let me stop the recording.